Scold's Bridle was first seen in Edinburgh in 1567, but it soon spread south. In mainstream education, the Middle Ages are often reduced to a few major events and figures. Yet, the era was rich with unique traditions and social practices that are scarcely mentioned in modern curricula. This video aims to uncover 15 such medieval traditions, exploring the peculiarities that shaped life during those times. Each practice serves as a lens, offering us invaluable insights into a world so different and yet, in many ways, strikingly similar to our own. Ducking stool was a 16th and 17th century form of punishment derived from the earlier cucking stool. Number 1. Trial by Ordeal Trial by ordeal was a judicial practice in medieval Europe that would seem utterly foreign, if not downright bizarre, to modern sensibilities. The core belief behind this method was that divine intervention would reveal the guilt or innocence of the accused. Essentially, it was a form of jurisprudence that lay in the hands of God, or so the medieval populace believed. In its various forms, the trial by ordeal required the accused to undergo a physically dangerous or painful task. If the individual emerged unscathed or healed quickly, they were considered innocent. Conversely, failure or injury was seen as a sign of guilt. Among the most well-known types of ordeals were the ordeal by fire and the ordeal by water. In the former, the accused had to carry a hot iron bar for a certain distance or pick up a stone from boiling water. Their hands were then bandaged and if the wounds healed cleanly within a prescribed period, usually three days, they were acquitted. In the latter, the accused was thrown into a body of water with hands and feet bound. Floating was seen as a sign of guilt, sinking as innocence. Trial by ordeal was not merely a medieval curiosity, but a complex social institution that embodied the era's intricate blend of faith, justice, and community. Over time, as legal systems evolved and the Enlightenment took root, trial by ordeal became obsolete. Yet it remains a fascinating window into the medieval worldview, a mirror reflecting complex beliefs about morality, divinity, and human agency. Number 2. Tithing and Frank Pledge Tithing and Frank Pledge were two distinct yet interconnected systems of medieval community self-regulation that may be unfamiliar to most of us today. While the concept of tithing giving one-tenth of one's income to the church, is commonly understood, its application in medieval England extended far beyond mere religious offering. In the absence of an established police force and complex legal systems, tithing served as a rudimentary form of civil responsibility and communal security. In its original form, a tithing was a group of ten households, with every adult male belonging to one. The essential duty of this group was mutual responsibility. If one member of the tithing committed a crime or was accused of one, it was the obligation of the other members to bring him to justice. Failure to do so could result in collective fines or punishments. This system was not merely theoretical. Tithing groups regularly met to discuss community matters, settle minor disputes, and ensure that everyone was adhering to their societal duties. These medieval institutions eventually became obsolete with the development of more sophisticated legal and governance systems. Nevertheless, they offer an intriguing glimpse into how communities of the past coped with challenges of social cohesion and governance long before the modern state assumed these roles. Number 3. Alchemy in Everyday Life Alchemy, often considered the precursor to modern chemistry, is usually associated with the mystical and the arcane, conjuring images of robed figures bent over alembics, seeking to turn base metals into gold or concoct the elixir of life. What is less commonly understood is how deeply ingrained alchemy was in the daily life of the medieval period, far beyond these lofty pursuits. At its core, alchemy was the study of transformation, not just of substances, but also of the human soul and the universe. Alchemists were the pharmacists, metallurgists, and sometimes even the cooks of their time. Their work had practical applications that touched on various aspects of daily living. For instance, the preparation of medicinal remedies was almost exclusively the domain of alchemists. From salves and ointments to potions designed to treat a range of illnesses, alchemy played a crucial role in medieval healthcare. The herbs and minerals they collected were not just for esoteric rituals, but also for practical healing. 
While alchemy may appear as a mystical, even misguided practice to modern eyes, it was a profoundly practical and deeply integrated aspect of everyday life in medieval society. The alchemists were not isolated figures shrouded in secrecy, but were integral to the community, providing essential services and spiritual insight. Their work was a blend of science, art, and spirituality that enriched all facets of medieval life, revealing a much more complex picture than the stereotypes often suggest. Number 4. Courtly Love and Troubadours Courtly love and troubadours may seem like topics reserved for romanticized tales of knights and castles, but they were integral parts of medieval social and cultural landscape. Far from mere fanciful ideals, these elements served nuanced roles, often challenging the era's social norms and providing alternative narratives about love, gender roles, and social hierarchy. The concept of courtly love emerged from the poetic imaginations of troubadours, lyric poets who thrived particularly in the Occitan-speaking regions of what is now southern France. Courtly love elevated romantic affection and unattainable desire to a form of spiritual enlightenment. Often these were stories of a noble knight's undying love for a lady, usually of higher social standing and often married. Far from consummation, this love was supposed to be platonic and spiritually uplifting, allowing the knight to become a better man and a braver warrior. Courtly love and troubadours served functions far more complex than mere romantic escapism. They offered a space for the negotiation and expression of new social ideals, subtly challenging established norms. Whether celebrated as a form of elevated affection or critiqued as an impractical ideal, the traditions of courtly love and the troubadours provide a rich tapestry through which to understand the complexities of love, social status, and cultural exchange in medieval society. Number 5. Medieval Guilds and Secret Handshakes Medieval guilds are often cited as the precursors to modern trade unions or professional associations, but their role and impact in medieval society were considerably more nuanced and pervasive. These were not just groups organized for economic benefit. They were deeply rooted social and even spiritual organizations that influenced everything from craftsmanship and trade to politics and education. Along with their formal regulations, guilds also had secret rituals, including unique handshakes and symbols, that solidified their influence and exclusivity. A guild was more than a professional organization. It was a brotherhood. Its members were bound by strict codes of conduct and craftsmanship, which elevated their trade to an almost sacred vocation. Apprentices were often taken under the wing of a master craftsman, going through rigorous training before they could become journeymen and, eventually, masters themselves. This process ensured a standard of quality, but it also created a system of mentorship that was as much about moral and social instruction as it was about learning a trade. This interconnectedness of economic, political, and spiritual life within guilds has led some historians to liken them to secret societies. While they were not necessarily clandestine organizations, the esoteric rituals and the immense influence they wielded over multiple aspects of medieval life make them unique historical phenomena that defy easy categorization. Through their multifaceted roles, guilds shaped the medieval world in ways that go beyond the crafting of goods or the trading of commodities. They were foundational in the development of what could be considered a professional class, setting the groundwork for modern conceptions of vocation and craftsmanship, while simultaneously serving as complex social entities with goals that went far beyond mere economic gain. Number 6. Jesters and Fools – Beyond Entertainment Jesters and fools are often depicted as the comic relief in the courts of medieval Europe. Their colorful costumes, jingling bells, and antics seemingly designed solely for the amusement of the nobility. However, their role was far more complicated and vital than mere entertainers. They were unique figures who navigated a complex social landscape, offering not just humor but also critique and insight, often veiled in satire and parody. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the medieval jester was his license to speak truth to power. Protected by the guise of the fool, jesters could say things that would be considered seditious or even blasphemous if uttered by others. They were allowed to mock, satirize, and question the decisions and actions of rulers, often serving as a voice for public opinion, 
or as a sort of safety valve for societal tensions. This candid critique, wrapped in humor, could provide rulers with perspectives that they might not hear from their more cautious advisors. Thus, jesters and fools were far from mere entertainers. They were social commentators, critics, communicators, and even spiritual figures, navigating complex webs of power, privilege, and taboo. Cloaked in folly, they held a mirror up to the society they inhabited, pointing out its contradictions and absurdities in a way that made them indispensable to both rulers and the ruled. Their role serves as a compelling example of how humor and satire have been wielded as tools of social commentary and critique throughout history. Number 7. The Ducking Stool The ducking stool is often relegated to a dark corner in the history of medieval Europe, commonly associated with the punishment of witches or unruly women. But this device, consisting of a chair suspended on a long wooden arm and often positioned near a pond or river, was more than just a tool of humiliation or torment. It served as an instrument of social control, a public spectacle, and a cautionary ritual that revealed complex attitudes toward justice, gender, and communal standards in medieval society. Designed for public humiliation, the ducking stool was not intended to be lethal, but the psychological and social consequences were severe. Primarily used against women accused of being scolds or nagging wives, it also targeted men and women accused of dishonest trading, as well as petty criminals. The punishment was both physical and symbolic. The accused would be strapped into the chair and repeatedly plunged into the water, while crowds gathered to watch, jeer, or throw things. This public spectacle was meant to enforce social norms and assert the collective will of the community. Interestingly, the ducking stool was also rooted in a complex theology of water. In Christian symbolism, water had dual meanings. It was both a purifying element used in baptism and a symbol of chaos and danger, as seen in the biblical flood. Dunking an individual could be interpreted as a form of exorcism or purification, expelling the sin or disorder they had brought into the community. Thus, the ducking stool was not simply a crude instrument of punishment. It was a multi-layered social, political, and religious act. It served to assert community norms, reinforce authority, and provide a cathartic, if disturbing, form of public entertainment. While the ethics of such a device are highly questionable from a modern standpoint, understanding its complexity provides a nuanced view of medieval concepts of justice, social cohesion, and gender roles. Number 8. Wandering Minstrels Wandering minstrels are a staple of medieval lore, often romanticized as free-spirited musicians who roamed the countryside, charming lords and ladies, peasants and priests alike with their songs and stories. However, the reality was far more multifaceted. These itinerant performers were not just entertainers. They were newsbearers, social commentators, and even political activists of their time, bridging the gaps between different classes, regions, and cultures. The songs of wandering minstrels often carried more than just melodies. They were repositories of social memory and oral history. They sung of great battles and legendary heroes, but also of love, loss, and everyday life. These songs were not only a form of entertainment, but also a medium for preserving communal histories and traditions, especially in a society where literacy was a luxury few could afford. The minstrels themselves, through their travels, helped spread these stories far and wide, acting as one of the era's main channels of information dissemination. Wandering minstrels were thus a vital part of the social fabric of medieval Europe. Far from being mere entertainers, they were multifaceted individuals who served as narrators of communal stories, commentators on social issues, and facilitators of cultural exchange. Their role is a testament to the complex ways in which art, politics, and community intersected in the medieval world, revealing the era as a dynamic and interconnected tapestry of human experience. Number 9. Feast of Fools The Feast of Fools, often dismissed as mere revelry or sacrilegious mockery, was actually a complex and nuanced tradition that held a special place in the medieval liturgical calendar. Celebrated around the New Year and culminating on the Feast of the Circumcision, January 1st. It allowed clergy and laity alike to invert the established social and religious hierarchies temporarily. For one day, 
Junior clergy and even lay members of the community could assume the roles of bishops or priests while engaging in various forms of jest, satire, and parody. This feast was not merely an ecclesiastical version of a masquerade ball. It was an institutionalized form of social critique and renewal. By upending the usual hierarchies, it created a space to question and critique the existing social and religious order. The inversion of roles acted as a mirror, reflecting both the absurdities and the sanctities of daily life and religious practice. Some scholars suggest that this annual spectacle served as a pressure valve for societal tensions, letting off steam in a controlled environment. Moreover, the Feast of Fools had roots in earlier pagan traditions and Roman festivals like Saturnalia, where roles were also reversed and norms were temporarily set aside. This suggests a continuity and adaptation of pre-Christian cultural elements within medieval Christian practice. Far from being a simple act of irreverence or blasphemy, as it was sometimes later criticized during the Reformation, the Feast of Fools was a sophisticated tradition that engaged deeply with issues of power, representation, and social cohesion. Number 10. Mystery Plays Mystery plays were not merely dramatizations of biblical stories designed for the entertainment or edification of medieval audiences. They were complex social events that engaged communities in a collective act of storytelling, interpretation, and even theological debate. Performed in open-air venues like market squares or in special wagons that traveled through towns, these plays were often sponsored by guilds, religious institutions, or even civic authorities. What sets mystery plays apart from other forms of religious expression was their inherently participatory nature. Unlike a sermon or a sacred text, which were largely one-way channels of communication, mystery plays involved the community as both spectators and performers. Ordinary citizens took on the roles of biblical figures, bringing a sense of immediacy and personal investment to these ancient stories. This active engagement allowed for a dynamic exchange of ideas, where complex theological concepts were translated into accessible human drama. Mystery plays were not just theatrical performances, but rather complex social and religious events that served multiple functions, from education and entertainment to spiritual engagement and social critique. They were a form of communal storytelling that allowed medieval society to explore, negotiate, and sometimes challenge their shared beliefs and values. Number 11. Scold's Bridal The Scold's Bridal, also known as a Branks, is an unsettling remnant of medieval Europe that symbolizes the era's complex attitudes toward freedom of speech, gender roles, and public punishment. This iron muzzle was designed to fit over a woman's head with a bridle bit that could be inserted into her mouth to prevent her from speaking. The primary targets were often women considered to be scolds or nagging wives, but the device was also used to punish gossiping, blasphemy, and even witchcraft. This punitive instrument did not merely silence the accused, it publicly shamed them. They were paraded around town, sometimes led by a chain by their husbands or local officials, for the community to witness their humiliation. The scold's bridle was not just a device of physical restraint, but also a symbol of social control, particularly over women who dared to transgress the rigid gender norms of their time. The Scold's Bridal serves as a cautionary tale from history, a stark reminder of the mechanisms used to silence and marginalize those who were seen as disruptive to the social fabric. While the device itself has long been relegated to museums and history books, the questions it raises about gender, power, and the limits of free speech remain deeply relevant today. Number 12. Heretic's Fork the heretic's fork is a chilling example of the lengths to which medieval authorities would go to enforce ideological conformity. This torture device consisted of a two-pronged fork attached to a collar, positioned in such a way that the victim could neither lower their head nor lie down without extreme pain. Primarily used by the Inquisition against alleged heretics, the fork symbolized the suffocating strictures placed upon free thought and religious expression during this era. The fork was more than a tool of physical torment. It served as a psychological weapon to break down the victim's resolve and extract confessions. This gruesome device was often used in conjunction with other forms of torture and public shaming, aimed at both punishing the individual and serving as a deterrent to others who might harbor heretical thoughts. 
Importantly, the use of such instruments was often backed by both religious and civil authorities, reflecting a society where church and state were closely entwined. While the heretic's fork is a relic of a bygone era, it serves as a sobering reminder of the dangers inherent in suppressing free thought and the lengths to which authoritarian regimes will go to maintain ideological control. The issues it encapsulates, freedom of belief, the ethics of torture, and the relationship between authority and individual conscience remain as pressing today as they were in the medieval world. Number 13. Sumptuary Laws Sumptuary laws, often overlooked in mainstream historical narratives, offer a fascinating window into the social anxieties and complexities of medieval society. These laws were enacted to regulate personal behavior and, more specifically, to control what individuals could wear, eat, or own based on their social rank. The primary aim was not just to maintain social hierarchy, but also to limit extravagant spending and ostentation among the populace. These regulations were surprisingly detailed, specifying the types of fabrics one could wear, the amount of embroidery allowed, or even the length of a knight's sword based on his income. Far from being seen as petty or intrusive, these laws were largely accepted as a necessary means of maintaining social order and decorum. They were a way to instantly recognize someone's social standing, thereby upholding the rigid class system that characterized medieval Europe. The enforcement of sumptuary laws was serious business. Fines, public shaming, or even imprisonment could befall those who dared to breach them. Moreover, these laws were not static. They evolved in response to economic changes, emerging fashions, or shifts in political power. For example, laws became stricter in times of economic hardship to prevent social unrest or resentment among the lower classes. While sumptuary laws may appear repressive and controlling by modern standards, they serve as an important indicator of the values and concerns of medieval society. They reveal a world deeply concerned with social stability, where the overt display of wealth or ambition by those not born to it was seen as a potential threat to the established social order. Number 14. Wife Selling Wife selling, an obscure and often misunderstood practice from medieval and early modern Europe, provides a lens into the complexities of marital relations and gender roles during this period. Contrary to popular myth, this practice was not a legally recognized form of divorce, but rather a public ritualized humiliation of the wife, often with her complicity, to signify the end of a marriage. It usually involved a public auction, where the wife was led to a market with a halter around her neck and sold to the highest bidder. The ritual was less about the actual exchange of money and more about publicly severing the marital ties. Often the auction was merely a formality, prearranged between all parties involved, including the wife. In some cases, it was a desperate act by impoverished couples who saw it as the only way to separate and start anew. While easy to dismiss as a barbaric or chauvinistic custom, wife-selling was a complex social practice that evolved as a response to the limitations of medieval divorce laws, which were often biased and rigid, leaving couples with few options for separation. The practice exposes the limitations women faced in terms of personal freedom and economic agency, but also shows the creative, albeit problematic, ways people tried to navigate an oppressive system. The phenomenon of wife-selling provides an unsettling yet revealing glimpse into the personal lives and social customs of our ancestors. It highlights the complexities of marital relationships, the limitations imposed by social and legal constructs, and the lengths to which people would go to find some form of happiness or freedom within those confines. Number 15. Ordeals of Knighthood Knighthood is often romanticized in modern depictions, filled with chivalry, bravery, and gallantry. However, the journey to becoming a knight in medieval Europe was an arduous process filled with rituals, trials, and ordeals designed to test and prepare aspiring warriors for their future responsibilities. Contrary to popular belief, knighthood wasn't purely hereditary. It had to be earned through a series of rigorous challenges that went beyond mere combat skills. The process often began with a period of pagehood, during which a young boy would serve a knight or a noble household, learning the basics of combat, horsemanship, and courtly manners. Around the age of 14, the page would then graduate to the status of squire, 
entering a more advanced stage of training that involved accompanying the knight in battles, taking care of the armor and weapons, and even acting as a sort of personal aide-de-camp. The final ceremony, known as dubbing, would involve existing knights or lords striking the squire on his shoulders with a sword, symbolizing his entry into the Brotherhood of Knights. This was followed by the Accolade, a series of oaths to uphold the virtues of chivalry, including loyalty to one's lord and the protection of the weak and innocent. The ordeals of knighthood served as a comprehensive training regimen designed to cultivate not just a skilled warrior, but also a virtuous individual. They were physical, psychological, and spiritual trials that embedded the medieval ideals of honor, piety, and social responsibility into the very identity of the knight.